Cheat Team America, powered by AWS, returns to sunny Florida with championships in both SRO3 and GT4 up in the air with just four races remaining. Memo Gidley and Jason Daskalos have a mere 18 points between them entering this weekend, while in GT4 it's a three-way battle royale between former champions Jason Bell and Ross Schwest and veteran Rob Holland, who has won five of the last six in a late-season surge. Today, those battles and more begin anew here at historic Sebring International Raceway. Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Marine. It's a pleasure to have your company. Calvin Fish is alongside and Amanda Busick is patrolling the pits for us here at Sebring. And without further ado, let's hear from Amanda and one of our championship contenders, Jason Daskalos, is standing by. That's right, currently second in the points with Jason Daskalos sitting up here on the front row next alongside Memo Gidley. Tell me how many times we've heard that this season. But Jason, I wrote down heading into this weekend that you pretty much need a flawless weekend. How true is that statement? Oh, yeah, we have to win today. I mean, Memo leading by 18 and with two races left. I mean, we definitely need a win today. So that's what we're going for. I know we've talked about the different names within the series, and that is Memo Gidley over there. He was just talking about just his experience back here in racing against Adaskalos. When you hear that, how much does the respect within the drivers on this track? Oh, I think we all have respect for each other. I mean, that's what you're supposed to have. So, you know, I respect him. He respects me. And, you know, we'll, we'll race clean, but it's going to get, if it's going to go for that win, we're, I'm going to put it in there. It is that time of the season when those things have to happen. And I am seeing some of the pit officials down here, guys. We're getting close to getting these engines fired. Appreciate it, Amanda. Great to hear from Jason down on the grid. And that's a great insight into his mindset. Frankly, it doesn't tell us anything we didn't know already. He is willing to be aggressive when the situation calls for Fighting it. Fighting words. Right? He's ready to go. And we've seen it before. He will put it in there as he's as he stated and make it happen. So Mimu's got to be on his toes here on this opening lap at least. Well, let's take a look at this Seabrook. International Raceway track, 17 turns, 3.741 miles in length. You can see the track records over on the side here for SRO3 and GT4. We expect those to fall here today, but this is one of those places, if you've never raced it before, it's on your list. You've got to race at Sebring at some point. Special, so unique. It runs on the old... Uh uh, airport runways and taxiways uh, make up a lot of this racetrack still. Renowned for the bumps, respect the bumps, and uh, getting this car working over these bumps is certainly a challenge. But these latest iteration of GT3 cars, they do that much better than in previous decades of racing these uh, similar powered machines, at least around this race circuit. So it's a smoother ride than it was in years past, but the main bones of this place to remain, the wrinkles are still there. So it's, it's really fun to come back and just embrace it. Don't resurface this place. Leave it just as it is and leave it up to the challenge for the drivers and the teams to get it sorted out. In the late 1940s, aeronautical engineer Alec Ullman was looking for a place to host a Le Mans style endurance race. And he identified the Hendricks Army Airfield here in Sebring as a potential spot. What a great choice that has turned out to be. So much history, so many of the great have raced and won here, and this is one place that celebrates its history as well as any racetrack in the country. It truly does. As you look at the screen left right now, you'll see a lot of the big names, manufacturers that have won the uh, legendary 12 hours of Sebring over the years, so they celebrate that, but I think the legend is the racetrack itself. I would make a case for legendary status for one Johnny O'Connell. He's in this race. He starts sixth. Eight times he's been a class winner here at Sebring. One of those times was an overall win as well. Yeah, and he said Sebring's just brought me great luck, so he's going to ride that wave coming in here this weekend. He's got a little bit of work to do, qualified six in that older generation Audi, but he still seems to be uh, battling for a podium every single weekend. But big news there. You spoke to that group. They may have a new car coming for next year, so stay tuned. Sounds that way. We'll talk more about that. But for now, let's look at the starting grid. Mabo Gidley on the pole, championship rival Jason Daskalos alongside. That could get spicy. Adam Adelson and George Kurtz alongside one another in row number two. Then you get to Anthony Bartone and Johnny O'Connell, the eight-time Sebring 12-hour winner. He starts sixth. Todd Trefford, local to Florida, starts in the seventh spot. And Mirko Schultes in the Callaway Corvette, set to start in eighth. Andy Wilzog at the back of the SRO3 field in a flying lizard-entered Porsche. Alex Vogel also in the field here today. 
then we go back to GT4, where Rob Holland continues this strong vein of form. Five wins in the last six. Unfortunately, the one that wasn't a win was a DNF, did not score points. That keeps the championship battle pretty close with Jason Bell, who starts in second, and Ross West, who starts further back. Elias Sabo and Tony Gables making his Sebring debut this weekend, starting in fourth. Gray Newell and the aforementioned Ross West. He's got some work to do, starting back in sixth. Then we go back to the 10th row. Scott Blind, after a strong debut at Road America, he's back alongside Tim Savage from nearby Naples, Florida. And finally, on the last row of the grid, Thomas Collingwood, great to see BGB back in the paddock, and Nick Shanny, who has had good pace going back to the Pirelli GT4 America race yesterday, didn't have the qualifying results, looking for a strong race number one here this afternoon. Yeah, Shani's really uh, developed uh, greatly over the last couple of seasons from a, a driver and a, a person who's done no sports whatsoever, was very much in the tech world, very successful over there, but under the guidance of Terry Borshell, he's come on leaps and bounds and has really put together some super impressive performances relative to his lack of experience in the sport. The format in GT America powered by AWS, it's a simple one. 40 minutes sprint to the finish, no pit stop, no driver change, multi-class racing, and it's been a phenomenal formula going back over the history of this World Challenge Series in its various guises, and certainly since GT America was brought on the scene a few years back, it's been a tremendous resource and an excellent addition to the championship, especially if you look at SRO3, the chance to run some previous generation GT3 machinery, but the class is evolving. And to your point, we talked about Ski Auto Sports. They expect to have a brand new GT3 car looking ahead to next year. They wouldn't divulge the secret of just what they're planning on campaigning, but uh, the team owners were telling me, look, this series has evolved. You can't get away with running the previous generation car anymore if you want to run at the front. And that might be especially true here at Sebring, given the bumpy track conditions. Yeah, uh, it's a real melting pot. But uh, for sure, when you look at this grid, it's tight. I mean, the top four cars on the grid are separated by uh, just a quarter of a second. And that fourth car on the grid is George Kurtz. He sent me a note after the two qualifying runs that he put together this morning. He said, for some reason, I just can't get the same feel with this GTA machine compared to his Fanatec GT Mercedes. So I'm sure that the Riley Group and everyone there at CrowdStrike are trying to uh, work all the tools and uh, dial in the knobs to try and sharpen that car up a little bit. So there you see him fourth in line, but Gedley has uh, been demonic on the starts here this year. Let's see if he can jump, get a jump on that front row with Daskalos alongside. Two formation laps, and a big part of that is getting these Pirelli P0s up to temperature, up to pressure before we turn these cars loose. While we have a moment, let's learn more about one of the great partners of SRO America, Pirelli. Hi, I'm Kyle Heyer with SRO America, and welcome to the Pirelli compound. All the tires for the race weekend are mounted and balanced for the race teams. Pirelli uses race tires as a proving ground for its technology that they roll into your road tires. They provide two compounds for racers to use Teams bring their unmounted rims to the Pirelli compound to have the tires put on. Basically, they'll grease up the outside of the rim, slip the rubber over, and seat the bead, which means that you're essentially connecting the rubber to the metal rim so that the tire can hold air on the racetrack. So after a session, teams will bring their tires back to Pirelli and have the rubber removed, give them the wheels back, and then they'll recycle the rubber to use at future events. A dry tire is one of the two compounds that Pirelli provides to SRO America. It's a tire that has a slick surface, meaning it has no tread, that gives it maximum grip in dry conditions. The wet tire has grooves in it, kind of like your road tires, that siphon water away from the tread of the tire and make sure that there's still contact patch on the ground during wet conditions. Pirelli mandates a minimum tire pressure to make sure that tires make it through an entire stint without damage. Tire management is a huge part of racing strategy, so in some of the longer races, like the Indianapolis 8-hour, You'll see teams try to double stint their tires to make them last multiple stints to find advantages on the racetrack. But when they come down pit lane, they'll get a fresh set of Pirellis and go back out there to win in SRO America. Thanks, Kyle. And thanks to Pirelli, longstanding partner of SRO, not just here in North America, but globally. We've seen some really fast lap times over the course of the weekend. All of the effort that goes into designing these cars, ultimately it all has to get put down to the road through these tires. It's a crucial element of any racing championship. He has a lot of work. Those tire fitters in the heat and humidity in Florida really got their work cut out for them on these big race weekends. One more chance to head pit side before the green flag. What do you have for us, Amanda? 
Well, you're taking a look at Rob Holland right there, and that's exactly what he was saying, the work ahead of him in that naturally aspirated Porsche. He said these are the worst conditions for this car all season long, but said if he had to make any effort for it, he's happy that he can manage it from the back, from the front rather than the back. And uh, just right on cue, talking to Jason Bell right alongside him on Road 1 and GT4, he said, I got to wait for people to make mistakes. So this is kind of the conditions that I love. It'll be a fascinating battle to keep an eye on those two very much in the mix for the GT4 title. Jason Bell's done it before. Rob Holland's been close each of the past two seasons, but is still looking for that first title in GT America, powered by AWS. And Ross West will still have to factor in as well. The safety car has accelerated away. The lights are off, which means the field is in the hands now of the Roval Pole Award winner, Mamo Gidley, TKO Motorsports. That's the Mercedes on the right-hand side of the screen. Jason Daskalos, his closest pursuer in the championship, starts alongside. We know he's going to be aggressive. We know he feels he has to win to stay in the mix. It looks like Daskalos is just leaning on the pole-sitting car of Gidley as he enters the VP acceleration zone. There's the green flag for SRO3. Now we wait for the GT4 field to get the green flag and the start to their race. But at the front, SRO3, it's Gidley leading Daskalos. Adelson slots into the third spot, and then George Kurtz and Anthony Bartone. Adelson on the attack there in that green and yellow Porsche, third in line. Daskalos protects the inside. Great start by our pole setter. Good launch and good first couple of corners. Saw Trefford emerge out front in a duel there with Johnny O'Connell, but a change for the lead in GT4. Jason Bell, the Florida native, has gotten around Rob Holland. Here's a fight a little further back. Ray Newell scrapping with Tony Gaples up and over the curbs is Gaples in that Black Dog Speed Shop Camaro. So often this season, we've seen Mabel Gidley's car come to life early. They work with the setup. They work trying to generate that tire temperature, even in the heat of the day here at Sebring. If you can just get that energy in the tire a little bit sooner and Gidley's comfortable, maybe putting up more on the line, but excellent start by our leader there. Strong start, it appears for Raj West as well. He's been able to make up a spot now. Sits right behind Gray Newell and would dearly love to make that pass. That would put Schwest up into the fourth spot and bring him a little bit closer to the two he's fighting for the title. Looking to go back to back in GT America powered by AWS. Gaples coming under pressure from Tim Savage in the TRG Aston Martin. Tim's got to settle in back in line. Single file behind the Camaro. Yeah, Blinz had a nice start there in that bright yellow car that you're looking at there. Coming into turn 13, he's got around Tony Gable. Savage now putting on the pressure on as well. Shani's hanging tough as well in that green and white Toyota. Looks like maybe some contact here. Gables leaning on. Blind just a tad. That's why he lost so much ground. That yep. was uh, pretty nice of Tony there just to give it up totally. Didn't want to turn him. He knew he'd get a penalty for that, so he's got to regroup a little bit. So, excellent qualifying run. You talked about his debut here at Sebring. Savage, big lunge down to the inside in turn 16. A dive plane on the left front of the Camaro might be damaged. It looked like it was bent out of kilter, and that could affect certainly the handling of that race car. We'll keep an eye on that for now. One lap in the book, Skidley leads Daskalos by one second. The fight, though, is for third. Adelson holds it in the number 120 Porsche from Wright Motorsports. George Kurtz, the reigning champ in SRO3, trying to take it away. Todd Treffer got around Johnny O'Connell on that opening lap as well. He's moved up to P6 in the number 41 CRP Racing Mercedes AMG GT3. Everyone's settling in now. Can Daskalos get the hammer down? Maybe Gidley will back up a little bit as we get to the halfway point in this race, but looking solid right now up front. And this is not what Jason wanted to see, and we heard from him on the grid with Amanda. He really wanted to get around Mamo Gidley and win this race to stay in the mix. It would balloon to a 25-point deficit if this race were to finish as they run, which, of course, a lot can happen still in the final 37 minutes. Yeah, Gidley five wins on the year, but he hasn't seen victory lane in four races, so he's anxious to get back on that top spot, and as you say, build that lead. Good little battle here with Gray Newell, Rosh West, that's the blue-colored uh, Aston Martin there, followed by the red one. Then Scott Blind having a nice uh, run again. Saw him uh, debut at Road America. Super impressive on debut. Had the pace, fit right in inside a very competitive GT4 field. And when you hear Mike Johnson, the team manager, talk highly about a driver, you stop and listen. Mike's worked with some of the best. 
Yes, no, he, he's a great strategist, great guy to have on your team, but he doesn't give praise easily. So when he's raving about a driver, that means something. Up front, Jason Bell looking super confident right now, pulling double duty here this weekend. He and Michael Cooper run in a Pirelli GT4 competition a little bit later today, so that helps him. Has the championship lead, it looks comfortable. Well, not comfortable, but looks okay. But then when you think about these uh, GT4 cars are allowed to drop an event score, so has two races, and that means that Rob Holland does not have to drop any points. He had a couple of disasters earlier this year, whereas uh, Jason does. So that lead is going to be actually just six points over Rob Holland, who he leads right now in this race. It's going to make for some interesting number crunching as we get to the finale at Indianapolis in a couple of weeks. But it's been a fantastic three-way fight all season long with ebbs and flows of strength from these three different protagonists. Jason Bell, Rob Holland, Ross West, all very much in the hunt for the title here in 2023. Tell you what, the margin that Gidley is building is remarkable. I mean, he's, he's only about six tenths off his qualifying pace here and a little bit more heat of the day. And he's a second clear in terms of the best lap so far over the majority of the competition. Eight, nine tenths over everyone. And helping him further is the fact that now Daskalos is going to have to play defense a little bit because Adam Adelson has arrived on the scene. George Kurtz there as well. So second, third, and fourth, all running nose to tail, about two seconds behind the leader, Memo Gidley. I'm just curious to see if that Delta starts to swing back as we dig deeper into this race. We've seen Gidley so often have these really strong starts. Can he maintain that pace? And then there is the mixed class aspect of this race too. There will be times when GT3, in the form of SRO3, that's what the class is called in this championship, overlaps with GT4. How you handle that traffic. We've seen that make or break races this season. Kurtz here trying to figure out a solution. Adelson had a really strong start to this race. Top four in qualifying set by about a quarter of a second. As we talked about, Gidley's pace here in race trip is remarkable. Now a lot of pressure here from Elias Sabo on Rob Holland, so that could certainly help Jason Bell's cause. Sabo's a little bit deeper in the points. Still looking uh, to back up what's been a pretty strong year. Three wins on the season, but a few uh, weekends that didn't go his way. Also had a win in Pirelli GT4 America last night. It's a triple header weekend for that championship. Their second race of the weekend comes up tonight, five o'clock local time. And Elias Sabo teamed with Andy Lee to pick up a win at this very circuit less than 24 hours ago. Jason Bell into a rhythm. I did not expect to see him pulling this sort of gap on Rob Holland. Look at that oh. car twist. He kind of tucked it in really tight there through the apex area of turn 17 and uh, really went for a ride. You got too much steering input as you start to hit that bumps. You can see it immediately tries to loosen up the rear end of the car as you uh, Basically have zero contact patch with the tide of the road at a certain point. Let's look at this again. Here's Jason Bell. And watch Rob Holland. He's pr pretty tight there. Right there, you can see the little twitch and correction. You told the story a few times this weekend, Calvin, about that turn and your experience racing here, not feeling like you hit it the same time one lap to the next. I, I really haven't. I mean, it's been a few years since I competed here, but I never felt I absolutely nailed it. You always feel, even when you get through there pretty cleanly, that you may have left something on the table. And when you try and dig for a little bit more, you'll hit one of those bumps a little bit more, uh, you know, aggressively, and suddenly you're along for the ride just trying to hang on. This is a good run for Bray Newell in the fourth spot. Cables is uh, closed back in here, so maybe adjusted to if there is any aero inefficiency with the front end of that Camaro. Five points still on the car, but it looks like it's flipped up. You can see on driver's right, our left, what it should look like. And I think that's where he made that contact with Blind back in the hairpin on the first lap. It's going to cost a little bit of aerodynamic balance, you would think. Yep, for sure. I hurt you turn in a little bit. Corners like that one, turn 13, tower corner, but Tony's got enough experience, he'll deal with it. Maybe work with the tools inside the car and uh, try and make some adjustments, but typically he races better than he qualifies, so let's see what happens as we dig a little bit deeper into this race. But here's a great little battle between the Aston Martins here. Gray Newell, 
Currently holding that fourth Rosh West giving chase. Rosh West, another one of these drivers that was racing in Pirelli GT4 America last night. He and co-owner and co-driver Aaron Povoledo didn't have much luck, got turned late in that race. No result to show for their efforts. And while you mentioned Jason Bell will be racing this weekend in Pirelli GT4 America, he did not race last night because that was not a car entered at NOLA Motorsports Park earlier this year. The reason there are three races this weekend is one was washed out by weather, rain and lightning back in the spring and had to be made up here this weekend. So if you weren't on that entry list at NOLA, you couldn't run last night. That's the situation Jason Bell found himself in for Pirelli GT4 America. We talk about the delta in lap time between uh, Mamo Gidley and the chasers here. It has dropped a little bit. It was up around eight, nine tenths to a second. It's now about six tenths, but Gidley is still putting down fastest laps of the day. So his best lap so far are two, 2.0 is only a tenth of a second off his qualifying run. So that's tough sledding. It's tough for these uh, chasers to go get him. And these three cars are dead even with one another. The last lap, Daskalos and Adelson ran laps to within one one thousandth of a second of one another to give you some idea. That's Mercedes up against the Porsche. George Kurtz was right there within the same tenth as well. So great parity amongst those three that run second, third, and fourth and are chased by this man, Anthony Bartone, currently P5. Ten minutes gone here in race one of the weekend. Let's get more from the pits now with Amanda. Well, we saw that little bit of a gap that Mamo Gidley has opened up on the field, and that's kind of kind of what he was hoping for ahead of this race. He said if there was a situation to check out, that would be great, but not guaranteed, as he mentioned, Jason Daskalos. And uh, he said that his mentality this weekend is cautiously aggressive. He does have quite a little bit of a points lead, but doesn't feel necessarily um, comfortable with it. But I, one of the unique conversations that we went on was this is the first time that Memo in quite a few years has been able to race in as many races as he has in a season. And he said that alone is uh, the success that he's happy about so far. Fantastic to see Memo applying his trade again at a very high level. Just reset the CrowdStrike fastest lap of the race. First driver to go sub 202 in the race here today. He had a couple of wins on his return back here in 2021, so it's been a happy hunting ground for Mamo. but we talk about what TKL means. It's uh, teaching kids options, but Mamo wasn't a kid when he got started in racing. He was 20 years old before he even uh, thought about going car racing, so a late bloomer had a stunning career. Remember Chip Ganassi racing in uh, Champ Car and had some big sports car rides over the years as well. Great measuring stick for the likes of Daskalos and Adelson and Kurtz. Good race here for Todd Trafford. Yep. CRP continuing to run really uh, strong Mercedes. A lot of history with that brand. Todd, a familiar name in the historic racing, vintage racing scene, won a lot of the big vintage events around North America, but stepping into wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, as it were, this year. We were told, look, he's going to be quick. It's finding the racecraft, finding the level of aggression that's needed to succeed at this level that he's going to work on, and we've seen him take big strides over the course of the season. The compression of that battle, four through seventh is what we're looking at there. Gray Nil continues to head that pack. Blind is looking like he's getting a little bit racier. Tony Gables has caught the pack. Josh West really needs to get this pass made. And this is bad news for him. He was right there in the points hunt with Bell and Holland, and they run one, two right now. He's stuck in fifth. Would be a lot of points to lose to his closest rivals in the championship. That plays with your head a little bit too. Do you know what I mean? You're, you're in a battle, you're, you're focused on trying to get around a car, and then all of the time up ahead you can see the guys that you're around in the cha championship having a better day, so that adds to the anxiety and the pressure to get this pass done. It's interesting, too, because we've seen Ross over the years. His pace has come up. His racecraft has improved. It, the key to his success last year, though, was consistency. It was just podium after podium, and he rarely put a wheel wrong, rarely took undue risk. 
The one thing I'm not sure we've seen a whole lot from him, though, is a situation like this one where you need to force your way through to stay in the hunt. Does he have that level of aggression when it's called for? Well, it's decision making, right? It's one thing around the aggression, but don't do a, a move that's too aggressive and uh, damages the race car or, or takes you out. This is Andy Wilsock running ninth overall. A little off there in that beautiful Flying Lizard Motorsports Porsche. Cost him a little bit of time, but able to gather it back up. Last lap, Adam Adelson was flying, ran a 2.022. That's only a couple tenths off of what Gidley did from the race lead, but the lead is close to five seconds now. Gidley to Daskalos, then Adelson and Kurtz. 25 minutes to go, back down to the pits and Amanda. Yeah, just a little add on Andy Wilzock. This will be the last weekend that we will see him out this year. He said that he's had a, you know, a relatively good season all around, has really enjoyed himself, but said to end it right here. It is his favorite track, and it was 24 years ago that he came here for the very first time at his very first motorsport event. That'll get the hook in. Coming to Sebring to check out what sports car racing is all about. And look, if you're old enough to remember flying lizard porsches racing and winning in this livery this is just so cool to see i love love what love what they've done with this car yeah it looks beautiful it did the day we saw it for the first time and continues to live iconic with their brand and uh, andy loves porsches talked to him uh, earlier this year about you know he said this car may be the the strongest in the field and he said but i'm not going to change I'm, I'm a porsche guy here we go. Holland getting defensive a little bit there. Elias Sabo still chasing. This is the fight for second and third. Yeah, I don't know if it's so much defensive or just looking for clean air. I know he's not exactly tucked underneath the uh, tail of the Aston Martin of Jason Bell, but maybe just looking for some clean air. We talk about these uh, cars and some of the safety nets that they have built into the electronics if they start to see extreme temperatures. So I'm not sure if uh, Rob is maybe flirting with that a little bit. Did hear in Amanda's report that Rob felt like the heat here could be to the disadvantage of the Porsche Cayman. That may be what he was banking on, was getting that lead and getting that clean air on the nose of that Porsche. And uh, Jason Bell may have been, have been thinking about that. So he got that move done early on the opening lap and uh, hasn't relinquished it. Just kind of set into a really nice pace for Jason Bell. Really impressive drive so far. And this battle here, blend in the bright yellow Aston Gables in the silver Camaro. A complete contrast in experience. Gables has been there, done that, racing at this level. Blind, this is a big step for him. And he's got a chance to measure himself against one of the most experienced drivers, maybe not at Sebring, but uh, in terms of races run over the last handful of decades. Blind has dropped back a little bit as he's feeling the heat from Tony Gables behind, so that's compromising his line maybe a little bit, and uh, subsequently Schwest and uh, Newell have uh, scampered off a little bit in front of him. That gives Schwest the breathing room necessary to complete the pass, although as I say that, it does seem like Ray Newell has found a little extra pace here at the midpoint of the contest, and now has more breathing room than we've seen for the bulk of this race. Tim Savage coming through a little bit further back. Having a nice run, though, for the TRG team. They'll be busy later on today running at Fanatec GT with a GT3 spec Aston Martin. Yeah, saw Kevin Buckler last night at the hotel. He's busy at entertaining guests just uh, returned late in the day. So they really work well with their partners. They give a great ROI, return on the investment for all of their people and uh, make it a real celebration of a race weekend. Just not the race itself, but all that you can enjoy over the course of a full race weekend experience. Is that diffuser a little bit low on the back end of that Schwest car? Looks like that was maybe come adrift there, and maybe almost hitting the deck. Yes, I think you're spot on. Get another look at it tails away here but that might help explain why ross might be struggling a little bit that yeah. cannot be a fun experience now it's going to make the downforce inconsistent into the brake zone and certainly through some of the corners so that's not easy to deal with those aeros uh aids are pretty effective here on these gt4 cars 
I'll be keeping an eye on this. This is a big battle for the GT4 points. Should point out, you kind of called this one, Calvin. Memo Gidley does have a tendency to be really quick out of the gates. And Daskalos might come back as the race progresses. It's starting to play out that way. Jason's cut a couple seconds off of Gidley's advantage, and maybe traffic has had something to do with it. Speaking of traffic, though, this is Daskalos coming under attack. Looks like he might have been held up by a GT4 machine, and Adam Adelson smells the blood in the water. He wants to grab the second spot and bring George Kurtz with him. Yeah, Daskalos was savvy to it. They just uh, kept his car on that right-hand lane, the inside line for turn seven there, so he uh, maintains that track position, but he is feeling the heat. And as to your point, it was just as this uh, chasing group was starting to match the pace of our leader, Memo Gidley, Adelson to the inside in turn 10. Wow. Has to give it up. Really George late. Had to run straight there. Had nowhere to go with the front end of that Mercedes right behind them. Adam so late on the break. Somehow the three of them coexist. Nick Shanny next to the cross crosshairs there in that GT4 Supra. He is going to be swallowed up by these front runners from the SRO3 field as they come blitzing by. Daskalos with some breathing room now, and it's Adelson who finds himself on the back foot, defending it against George Kurtz through turn 16. Yeah, and it certainly seems like this traffic has played to the advantage of our leader, Mamo Gidley, there on that lap anyways. Sorry, now through turn 16, Kurtz puts the pedal down. He's there in the slipstream, and Adelson knows it. Immediately he goes to driver's right trying to cover off the inside into turn 17. This is the newer generation Porsche, different to the car that he runs in Fanatec GT. Had to bring this car into service at Road America when he had a, an accident early in race one there. So getting more familiar with it. I think the team is certainly uh, getting uh, dialed in more. Had a really strong qualifying performance here this morning for Madison Snow and Yen Halen. How much did that cost Jason Daskalos in his pursuit of Mamo Gidley? About a second. It was about four seconds flat. The gap from first to second on the previous lap, it's now up to five. Yeah, I think the fastest car of the three that we've been focused on here, Daskalos, Adelson, and Kurtz, maybe Kurtz. So we talked about him not being super comfortable with this race car in comparison with the car that he campaigns in Fanatec GT. You know, identical cars, you think, but just sometimes uh, the, there's a nuance to the setup. What works on one doesn't always translate to the other. Look at that defensive there by Adelson. Kurtz had a bit of a run. This isn't going to be great. Catches Tim Savage at a difficult part of the racetrack. Tim really with nowhere to go. He can't disappear. Does his best and does a pretty good job to not impede this battle. Should note that it looks like Tony Gables did get around Scott Glind in that GT4 battle. That was for sixth. Yeah, and now Gables has caught Schwest. Yeah, and we get into what we're now into really multi-class racing, and this is where George Kurtz may have a little bit of an advantage in Adam Adelson in terms of his experience dealing with multi-class racing. That was close there for George, just kind of using all of the road. He kind of missed that. Aston Martin and Scott Glenn by very much there on the exit of turn 13, but given everything right now, putting the pressure on Adelson. So we're past the halfway point. This is where the time management, even in these 40 minute races, starts to come into play. Tire management, traffic management, all in play. With 17 minutes and change to go. Race one of two this weekend for GT America, powered by AWS. Adelson hard on those headlights, letting Gables know he's coming through. It was a late move, but Gables left enough space. Schwest tripped out wide. That was but tight. Mm. Oh, he went for a gap there that really didn't exist. I thought they were going to hit. Yep, I did too. George Kurtz, though, also was caught out by that traffic. Doesn't look like he's going to be able to benefit from that. Tony Gables has uh, got around Blind, obviously. Now he's on the attack on Schwest down into turn one. This might be where Schwest is vulnerable with that damaged diffuser. Gives some room to the inside, but able to fend off Gables. Now this fight continues for third in SRO3. Adelson and Kurtz locked nose to tail as they have been for the better part of this race. Great little battle. Daskalos has escaped a little bit. He can now focus forward. But just the traffic once again. Gidley had a second and a half on this chasing pack, so he's just catching the traffic and managing it beautifully and extending that lead now up to 6.7 seconds at the front of this field. Report from Amanda in the pits. Team at Schwest Povoledo Racing has told her Ross is not concerned about the handling of the car. Says the car feels okay despite that loose diffuser. 
and will need to beat because he's got the hard charger, Tony Gables, locked in right behind. Tony will see that, we'll have a good uh, viewpoint of that. He's coming loose. Probably radio and into his crew saying they need to black flag him. I don't want to be driving over that. He should have come completely off the race car, but they're going to let him go. Now Schwest is on the attack wow. again. He has caught Gray Newell, and he's done so quickly. Hand over fist. Not sure how Newell lost time there. There was no traffic in front of him to uh, create that situation, but suddenly Schwest had a big run. Ah. Treffer dives down to the inside. Here comes Johnny O'Connell trying to keep Treffer honest. Treffer got around Johnny O on the opening lap, and that gave us stay pretty stable here for the rest of the race. Very impressive drive from Todd Treffer. O'Connell swinging to the inside, as you saw a moment ago in that previous generation Audi. Race Vision powered by AWS Top Speeds. Mercedes with George Kurtz, 159. Marco Schultes in the Callaway Corvette. It's 157, as does O'Connell, as does Adelson. Martone at 156, four different brands in the top five. Yeah, that's great. It that really means that the uh, balance of performance, how they got all of these uh, manufacturers equalized has uh, been done very well. George Kurtz continues to put the pressure on Adam Adelson. Let's hear more about the reigning champ from Amanda. Yeah, I was talking to him ahead of uh, practice yesterday. He said that they had made some adjustments to this Mercedes, specifically ahead of Road America. He went on to sweep that weekend and said he's been really happy uh, with this car ever since. But he said really this season in GT America, if you go back to St. Pete, it was just such a rough weekend. He didn't know if he'd ever be able to make it up to defend the title here this season. So he said he's really been leveraging the time here in GT America to make a play at that Pro-Am championship in GT World Challenge. And Colin and George are leading the points over there. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's always a conundrum when you got two cars and you're on the racetrack within a few minutes of one another. <laughs> one feels slightly different. So they feel like they're making progress, but certainly after the run this morning, George alluded to the fact there were still some subtle differences between the two cars. So I think they, you can learn from each car though, right? So uh, they'll continue to look at the notes and see what's working, what direction do we need to go in? And uh, the more and more years they get under their belts, that's where that notebook comes into play, particularly with someone with the experience of Bill Riley, who's kind of steering the ship, so to speak. This is a track that George Kurtz knows well, and he's tasted success here. Won his class in the 2021 edition of the 12 Hours of Sebring. The great story to share with me this week when I was texting with him, uh, he said, one of his favorite racers who's winning that 12 hour race. And literally as he's walking from the rostrum, he walked over a Mario Andretti brick. And right at that time he had his phone in his hand, Mario texted him to congratulate him on the win. He said, that's uh, a special, special moment for George Kurtz, who really loves the history of the sport and an admirer of Mario Andretti, of course. Who isn't? Yeah, just a legend, just such a cool guy. This has been a great scrap all race long. It has not relented. Rob Holland lost the lead. He started on pole. Bell was able to take it early. And ever since, he's been on the defensive. Elias Sabo probing, trying to find a way through. Yeah, Holland's using every ounce of his experience here to keep that Aston Martin behind him. But we know that Elias is not afraid to push the envelope, so to speak, in terms of any opportunity. He's got a big run here. Rob just uh, sits in the middle of the road. Makes it really tough to get down to the inside. It's the dirty part of the racetrack, so it's big risk if you just try and stuff it down the inside there. Cars have uh, ABS brakes, but that just takes away braking if you do dig into that right at the uh, critical point at the apex where you may meet. Porsche versus Aston. And Aston has been the dominant platform for most of this season in GT America, powered by AWS GT4 competition. Rob Howard, though, has been the consistent thorn in the side of the Astons all throughout the year. He really has. Just uh, went on a tear, had that unfortunate situation at Road America where he got taken out. Otherwise, it would have been six on the bounce. 
just really caught everyone's attention. The guys like Jason Bell, Ross West, who thought it was going to be a dust up for the championship deal between those two and maybe Elias Sabo, but just the run that Rob Holland's been on has been tremendous and thrown him right into this championship fight. Certainly. All started at the street course in Nashville. Actually, it started at VIR before that and then continued over to Nashville. But by Nashville, that's what we kind of realized, especially with the dropped event rule in terms of points in GT4 only, it's worth noting. That does not affect SRO3. And it's an event. It's not like you can just Correct. pick two races randomly from the season. It's one whole weekend. And Rob Holland had a zero score under his name. And uh, so he doesn't have to drop any points, whereas uh, right now, as the season so far, Jason Bell would have to drop 19, and Ross West would have to drop 23, which really tightens everything up. The gap, by the way, first to third is 23, without the drops, or, or at least it was. I should say that was going into Road America, so that's that's actually an old stat. Excuse so 25, me. Yeah. Think, yeah. But it gives you an idea of what a difference those drop scores could mean for the top three in points. Goodly, just what a run. I mean, they have absolutely nailed the setup on this car. I and mean, when we talk about the qualifying performance and he's been uh, matching that, that pace here in the race, and we thought that maybe, okay, he'll come back to the field. That has not been the case. He just continued to drive the car forward. And on that last lap, was still like half a second, three quarters of a second better than the rest of the field. He and Sam White, the team manager there, have obviously got their act together here this weekend, trying to finally get back onto the top step of the podium. Holds the crowd strike fastest lap of the race. Only driver under 202 on the day. 201.996. That was set about 10 minutes into this 40-minute race. We're into the final quarter. Under 10 minutes to go. Gidley on cruise control, leading by eight and a half seconds over this battle. Daskalos and Adelson. Kurtz has got around Adelson here. Oh, excuse me, that is Daskalos, excuse me. Kurtz not far behind. Yeah. Adelson's actually closed on, on Jason here, so it's got me confused. They were a bit further back, so Daskalos either hit traffic or Adelson just on the march forward. Of the pair, Kurtz, of the trio, I should say, Kurtz is the quicker at the moment. He ran a 2.02.9. These two in front of him ran 2.03.4s, both of them within the same hundredth of a second at last lap. Johnny Red, Johnny O'Connell aboard the Ski Autosport Audi. It's hard to believe I was looking at uh, some notes from the team about, you know, Johnny's success here. As you mentioned, Ryan, eight-time winner here at Sebring, uh, once a overall winner. But it's been 13 years since he last competed in the 12 hour here at Sebring for Corvette Racing, and that's how time flies. I mean, I couldn't believe that number. Wins in 1993, 1994, that one was also overall. The rest of these are in class. 1995, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2008, and 2009. He knows how to get around Sebring. Well, Christensen has a corner named after him. He's a sick time winner here, I believe, and uh, maybe Johnny O needs one as well. Let's start the campaign right Let's here, right now. Rob Holland, Elias Sabo continue hammer and tong to scrap it out for second in GT4. The lead for Bell is 3.3 seconds. You can just barely see him come through the shot from time to time ahead of these two. And there's such a nuance to this, Ryan, because you think, oh, it's just two cars running closely together, pretty evenly matched. Well, there's the racecraft of Rob Holland, the experience where he's placed in that race car. Then there's the patience for Elias Sabo, who's not afraid to get his elbows out, but recognizes that Rob is doing such a great job. It's risky, do you know what I mean? And he also recognizes the big picture. Holland's very much in the championship fight. Doesn't want to uh, get too feisty here, but See if it stays this way all the way to the checkered flag. Are these guys frustrated right now, or are they having fun? They're having fun. I think Holland's probably frustrated that he doesn't have the pace of Jason Bell. I think after qualifying, he probably thought, maybe I got the slight edge. But once when he got in a race trim and he got some fresh air on the Aston Martin, Jason Bell has just taken off here. What other story to watch? The grid for race one is set by a qualifying session. 
The grid for race two is set by fastest lap from race one. Jason Bell in GT4. He has a bus sniff over mark. Sabo. I think Sabo's second quickest. Yeah. Rob Holland would be the third quickest. And in uh, GT3, Gidley has the fastest lap of the race overall, and I think it would be Daskalos on the front row once again. Yep. Sabo taking a peek. Not close enough to truly threaten Rob Holland, and not much is going to rattle Rob. He's got British touring car experience, lots of laps at the Nürburgring, had some World Touring Car Championship races over the years. Probably the most successful GT America GT4 driver over the years to not have won a title. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he's really rock solid. Kurtz has got back up on the wheel, so Daskalos has escaped yep. Adelson a little bit, and that's allowed George to get back on the tail of that green and yellow Porsche there. Try to pick up the draft here, down Ullman. That's where that newer generation Porsche struggles a little bit for straightaway speed, so George is trying to use it after right until the very last second pop out, but Adam's got his car perfectly positioned to resist. He does, as long as he doesn't drift down too wide here on exit. Can George cross him over? He cannot. allison has got that pretty well sorted out. How to defend into sunset. They'll need to do it a couple more times, under five minutes to go. Closing stages here. Just three races to go after this one in this 2023 season. This is where drivers are almost like boxers. They're just kind of doing those uh, body punches right now, just trying to work over the car in front to uh, create that knockout blow where you can suddenly jump through and grab that position. And it, it, it's fun. I mean, it's so, oh, oh that was a rough one. But strange that late in that corner to uh, drop a wheel there, but, but pretty rough ride there, didn't it? It did. It didn't damage the front split or anything on that right front. Looks okay. Kurtz will have to gather it back up. And drop it wheels just a little bit. That's more customary there at the exit of the hairpin. Kick it up the dust. Does look like Adelson's drawing a bead on Daskalos <laughs> again. The ebbs and flows of this has been fascinating. Concertina effect on this uh, three-way battle for the podium spots. Gidley, by the way, nearly 12 seconds ahead, actually over 12 seconds now. Dominant. At this stage of the lap. This beautiful race that he's put together. Got the jump, got the first lap that he needed. Didn't look back, was just looking forward. Just caught the tail into that. It looked like Sabo was really, really close to Rob Holland that time. We'll go to the defensive line here, middle of the road, on Cars the run to the hairpin. So evenly matched. Uh, a Amanda talked about the, the Porsche may be in suspect in this heat, but um, he's doing a good job. Uh, maybe a little further to driver's right than we've seen him previously in the run to the hairpin. Finding that defensive ground and holding it. My money's on uh, Sabo to make a move somewhere. Uh, he's just been so patient. I know he's learned a lot developed his race craft, but I think he's going to have a little poke somewhere. Well, and he comes in with a very outside chance at a championship. He's not going to win it with body blows. He's got to throw a haymaker at some point. So to your point just there, I think you might be right. If he sees a window, I suspect Elias is going to make the jump. Yeah, I think of him and Daskalos with a similar personality in terms of uh, if, there's a, if there's a chance, they're going to try and take it. SRO3 traffic up the road. That's Andy Wilzock. Flying Lizard. Something might be wrong with Andy there. Yeah, I thought yeah, he he's... looked off the pace. It's too bad on his final weekend of the season. Hopefully it's nothing that puts tomorrow into jeopardy as we enter the final two minutes of the race. Gidley leads Daskalos, Adelson and Kurtz. Bartone fifth in SRO3, then in GT4. Jason Bell leads this duel. Rob Holland, Elias Sabo, Tony Gaples not too far behind. Then it's Gray Newell and Ron Schwest. So Gaples has been the man on the move. He's charged up a few spots to get up into the fourth position. And this is a big blow 
for Ross Schwest championship efforts here. Yeah, going to be a big swing between he and Jason Bell, so not the ideal day. Let's take a look here. Is there contact? There I was. think there is. Yeah, you can see the damage yeah. on the grill of the AMG. That was uh, lucky it wasn't a little bit deeper into the corner where there was more turning going on with that Porsche. So uh, George is pushing hard. Just missed his breaking point. Sometimes when you have to break that little bit harder, that will activate the ABS and takes away some of your stopping power at the same time. So that may have occurred right there, but really there's a symmetry between our GT3 uh, overall leader and yes. our GT4 leader in terms of they both lead the championship. They're both put together just beautiful drives so far this afternoon. And behind them, that's where we found the battles all race long, second and third, sometimes fourth in the mix too. There's the white flag for Mamo Gidley looking for yet another win. And he's got one more tour of Sebring to do. So he looks to extend that lead over Daskalos. Here is Gidley, TKO Motorsports. What a fantastic season he's put together. Love to cap it off with the title. Looks like he's closer than he's been. That's what happened to Schwest maybe. I think there was a tire rub possibly left front. I saw some smoke going into the brake zone, but he goes around. And again, this has been a wounded car. He's got that diffuser damage. That cost him a couple more positions, actually. That is a disaster for one of the championship aspirants. Yeah, and looking at the shadow under the car, looks like the front end uh, underneath might have a little damage there. There you see some uh, smoke again when he gets to the brake pedal for uh, yep. tower corner there. So he's struggling. He's just trying to get it home at this point. He does have Nick Shanny closing in. There is smoke coming off of that car. Just has a couple more corners to try and hold off Shanny for what would that be? That would be. Well, it's well down in the top 10. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, I think it's eighth and ninth that they run right now in class. Shanny has caught him. The leader will come through this fight at the back of the GT4 field. And Mamo Gidley should clear it with no trouble. On the final lap, Mamo Gidley looking to extend his point advantage over Jason Daskolo. Started the race off by securing the pole, drove away and secured a big lead, made his way through traffic with a plum, and now through Sunset Bend, all that's left is to take the checkered flag. Mamo Gidley, TKO Motorsports win race one at Sebring International Raceway to extend the championship advantage. Here we go. We talked about Sabo making a move on Rob Holland to the flank there down into the brake zone, but Holland Racecraft just protects that inside line. Tough place to roll the outside. Sabo gave it a good go. Not going to be many more chances here on the final lap. There's your leader in GT4, Jason Bell, dropping back to the fight for second and third. Sabo again closes in under braking. He might be close enough to make one, one more run into Sunset Bend. Yeah, and I think Bell might be a little bit closer to these guys than he was on the previous lap. So he's probably trying to manage this last lap, not make any mistakes. Clears tower corner, heading off to Bishop. Battle continues behind him, but I'll certainly give hope to these two drivers. Think, well, we're battling for second. Is that win potentially on the cards? Does Bell have an issue? Rob Holland digs a little bit deeper down in the seat, looking for a little extra pace. Is there something amiss with Jason Bell? Can he hold off Elias Sabo? So much still up for grabs with just a couple corners to go in race one of the weekend. Yeah, I think Bell's just managing it. I think he was just taking no risk there on that final lap and allowed these uh, two drivers to get maybe a little bit closer. Just a fantastic drive by Jason Bell, grabbing that lead on the opening lap and uh, didn't let it go. Made the pass for the lead early on Rob Holland did Jason Bell and he never looked back. Here comes the fight for second through the final corner, but out in front, Jason Bell, Flying Lizard Motorsports prevail in race number one. Second goes to Rob Holland, holding off the hard charging Elias Sabo in the battle for the second and third positions. And in the background, there's Tony Gables and Gray Newell completing the top five in GT4. Yeah, great run by Tony. Didn't have the best of starts, best uh, first couple of laps, but then went on the attack, had that little bit of damage to the front end, but nonetheless, really solid top five finish. Grand strike fastest lap of the race to Mamo Gidley, and with it, the Rover pole position. Looking ahead to tomorrow, 
That is exactly what he was hoping to achieve here in race one today. Yeah, back to his winning ways, as we said. Uh, four races, he hadn't seen victory lane, and uh, suddenly he's back on top right when he needs it with the championship getting down to the wire here. Three rounds to go. He builds that lead a little bit deeper. What is it, 25 points now, I think? Uh, yep. Heading into tomorrow's race. Full win advantage. Exactly. 75 points still on offer this season with three races to go, but effectively a full race lead now for Mamo Gidley over Jason Daskalos, who did his best to limit the damage, staunch the bleeding, if you will, fending off Adam Adelson. It was less than half a second at the line between those two. And then Jason Bell, who has been so hungry to get back to victory lane. He's found some consistency here in 2023. Hasn't always had the race winning pace though, Calvin but a big result for Jason Bell in pursuit of his second series championship. Provisional results, Gidley, Daskalos, Adelson, Kurtz and Bartone, the top five, then Treffert, O'Connell, Vogel, and Wilzock. Jason Bell, the winner in GT4, ahead of Holland, Sabo, Gaples, and Newell. That is the way they finished within the top five. Tim Savage, Scott Glenn, as well, looked like Mirko Schultes had an issue on the final lap. He drops a little bit down the order. Nick Shanny does just edge out Ross Schwest and Tom Collingwood completing the top 20 overall here in race number one. Let's take a look now. Highlights from the first race. Green flag waved ahead of Memo Gidley. He was able to consolidate that lead. The fight was on behind though. And it was a fight that would continue for the full 40 minutes. Jason Daskalos and Adam Adelson, George Kurtz in the mix as well. Yeah, fascinating battle there for the final podium spots behind Gidley. A little bit of argy-bargy here on the opening lap. Tony Gables and Scott Flynn, and a little bit more there between Adelson with the class overlap there. Yeah, that might have been where the damage was done to Ross Schwest's diffuser. That was costly for him. Late in the race, a little contact there, nose to tail. Kurtz into the back of Adelson. But at the front of the field, here we see it. Mamo Gidley through the final corner, taking the checkered flag, and yet another race win. Extends his advantage to 25 points with three races still to go. And Jason Bell snags a long-awaited win. It's been a little drought for him in terms of getting to victory lane, but it gets it done here at Sebring, and he's very much in the title fight, too, heading into the final few races for GT4. Good racing here at Sebring. And we have another race still to come. Hope you join us for that tomorrow. Coming your way from Sebring International Raceway.